give a warm welcome to writer, director, producer, Cord Jefferson. And Jeffrey Wright. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having and us. Thank you all yes. so much for being here and checking it's, out the film. You know. Especially on the, on the morning that you guys were nominated Jeffrey Best Actor SAG Award this morning. And, uh, <laughs> and Cord, uh, your ensemble is also nominated for SAG, and you're responsible for that. Yeah. And... <laughs> Directors Guild Award nomination for uh, first time director. Yeah, so. thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So a big day. It was a big day, and a big day. I'm so glad that you guys are here to celebrate with us. Um, Court right off the bat, the fact that there is uh, this family that that Monk has is so layered, so nuanced. And you combine that with the, the satire, and they balance each other out. Can you tell us about the importance of, of emphasizing so much that, the, the family dynamics? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, when I set out to make the film, the, uh, one of the sort of guiding principles at the outset was that I knew I wanted to make something that felt satirical, but not farcical. And so I wanted to make sure that we avoided uh, getting too broad and that we avoided the comedy getting so big that the entire film collapsed under the weight of it and sort of it became silly and slapsticky. And so um, That's one of what the- what I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> this was Jeffrey's Jim Carrey turn. Uh, but to me it was uh, important then, it, with that being sort of a guiding principle, to have some balance there and not to be so focused on just the comedy beats all the time. And I think that, you know, just on a technical level, one of the things that the family stuff does is, is help sort of ground everything and sort of like really root it in an emotional territory so it's not just all sort of, you know, I really like the comedic scenes, but I sort of wanted it to be more than that. And I think that it was also important to me to, to have this family story. I think one of the one of the themes of the film is that is that we we, too, uh, too rarely get to see just the nuance and complexity and depth and breadth of black life. And then we sort of, we, we, don't, we don't really get to dig into these, these ca characters of color the, the way that we should, you know, that they very frequently, it's just kind of one note, very um, surface level depictions. And so it was important to me, you know, I think that the sort of the, the juxtaposition in the film is this guy who's upset because he's saying, you are not giving us sort of you're flattening our lives and reducing us to these caricatures and these sort of stereotypes and so and then opposite that you're seeing these real black human beings you're who are going the yeah, talk. who are sort of who are sort of going who are living complex difficult funny sad tragic you know just just normal lives just normal people's mm. lives and so it was important to me that we not lose sight of some of that and make sure that we had these characters who felt lived in, who felt real, and who felt like a family. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine said, and who put the fun in dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeffrey, when I met you outside, I, 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 I'm in awe of your career. I've seen you throughout, throughout you know, you know, over 20 years, and what, you, you're like you the- You saw Angels in America? That I you saw did? five times Angels in America on Broadway. Yeah, that was- And I, I mentioned I saw Top Dog Underdog at the public and on Broadway, and the free men of color, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well I mean, Angels in America is 30 years ago, so- uh, And I'm 60 years old, so do the math. Uh, we, we, smoke we, on we, your pipe we, and put that in. We, we were both younger then. Yes. <laughs> but, but if you saw Angels in America five times, that's- uh, 35 hours of theater. <laughs> yes, yes. That's yes. impressive. Yes, and I saw the revival twice, but well, let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> it's about you. You're the, I mean, when I think about you, it's like the ultimate shape, shape shifter. You, you, you get lost in the physicality of the character. Monk is, it's like I've never seen you. It's like you're not hiding behind, um, you know, this, 
uh, you know, physicality of the character. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, um, this was definitely the character that I, I, there was for me the least friction in placing myself inside. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. It's funny that you, 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 you mentioned that because I, I was always interested in, in actors who created character, who were one man in one project, another in another woman, uh, particularly folks like Dustin Hoffman. Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman, of course. Um, uh, you know, uh, Alec Guinness. I just loved that aspect of what I guess considered the magic of our work. Mm -hmm. um, Gary said something, and Gary is more, a huge, inf enormous influence on me. When I saw Sid and Nancy, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. We can actually, I thought we could go there, but we can actually go there in terms of his emotional range mm -hmm. and, uh, and the force with which he just like let it all go. So when I did Basquiat and he, I met him and we worked together in that, that, that is in some ways derivative from what I saw him do in, in Sid and Nancy. Huge, huge impact on me. He said something the other day in an interview that I saw in which he described playing different types of characters as you describe as a way of hiding himself, but also revealing himself that he found a freedom by you know, wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. He said that to play a role closer to himself scared him to death because of you know, the nakedness of it. And this character, yes. Um, Did it scare you? No. I think it scared me later as I realized, wow, you are very much like him. <laughs> 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 the things that scared me were the more unfortunate sides of his character, <laughs> which I know very well um, mm -hmm. and have suffered some of the consequences as Monk has suffered uh, as uh, too. So um, it, 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 it is, yeah, it's um, for Cord and for myself, the narrative um, for Monk is one that we were very familiar with. Cord describes having read this novel Percival Everett's Erasure, which he adapted for our film, thinking that it was a book written for him alone. Uh, there were so many overlaps. For me, when I read Cord's script, I felt similarly, um, particularly around this story of the family and the story of a man who is uh, out of the blue, reached that point in his life where he's asked to be the adult in his family, um, owing to crisis, an ailing mother, uh, when he's asked to be caretaker to the woman who was his caretaker. So um, uh, Cord can talk about his experiences, but my mom passed about a year before I got this script. I had the good fortune of being raised by two women, my mother and her eldest sister, my aunt, who's now 94 years old. She came immediately I, to live with us in New York. My mom went very quickly, but I was, you know, I can, I'm proud to say that I was caretaker for for her, I'm an only child. Monk wants to be an only child, so there's alignment there. <laughs> but, 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 I, but I understood, having gone through that, the pressures that, you know, that, that, um, that come along with that level of responsibility and the sacrifices that one is asked to make relative to uh, uh, profession and to personal relationships and things like that. And I was, I was really hooked emotionally in an intimate way by that aspect of the film, and uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a bit of me in there, and uh, it didn't take a lot of, sh you know, it didn't take a lot of morphing at all, yeah, mm -hmm. to find um, that, that guy. Cord, one of the remarkable things about your directing is that the tone, um, you, you bring us all in, you don't um, sermonize, you don't spoon feed anything, it's, it, it, we, we feel we feel part of the story, you know, can you tell us about that dynamic and? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> this movie was in some ways an experiment to see if we could still find a way to talk about these kinds of issues in a way that feels inviting to everybody. And so, um, you know, the, 
yes, this this movie deal, you know, we are, uh, I'm quickly realizing that we are the most polarized we'd ever been, we've ever been in this country in my lifetime, and I, yeah. I think, I think certainly in the, in the, in the world. And I think that one of the reasons that we are so polarized is because we've lost the ability to talk to people who are different from us. And, and we've lost the ability to, you know, now everybody sort of exists in their own fiefdoms where it's Fox News isn't even conservative enough for the conservatives anymore. Now they have OAN and Newsmax. And, and we sort of, we're, we're all consuming our own news. We're consuming our, our own movies. There's conservative movies and liberal movies. There's, there's sort of conservative news and liberal news and, and never the twain shall meet. And it just feels like we have all become so um, conditioned to not want to talk to people who are different from us. Who, you know, I, I grew up in a very strange household, and that my father is a black Republican and my mother was a white liberal. And so I, I didn't, I, it was, and this is what you get. Yeah, <laughs> you get a, 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 a real weirdo. Uh, um, and and so 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 in my house there was there was uh, I sort of look back on that as a as a really good thing because it allowed me to see that you know just because somebody thinks differently from you that that, that doesn't make them a horrible person it just makes them somebody who thinks who believes in different things than you believe and that's okay and that we are we are all still sort of have this shared humanity and that's what we should focus on and so to me this thank you sure and to me what I wanted to do with this movie was was say like yeah we're, this is a movie that's going to talk about race it's going to talk about sexuality it's going to talk about identity it's going to talk about politics and yeah, m maybe it's going to make you uncomfortable from time to time, but ultimately I wanted it to feel inviting. I didn't want it to feel mean-spirited. I didn't want it to feel like this is for people in New York and LA. This is for people who vote this way. This is for people who are th this ethnicity. Like I, I, I wanted to make something that just felt like we can all come in. Like that, the, the beautiful thing about the cinema, uh, to me, is the, is the same thing that's beautiful about libraries and about concert halls, right? Which is, it's this place where no matter who you are, you can come have this shared cultural experience with, with strangers around you, right? And that's a beautiful thing about movie theaters. And so um, the goal for me was kind of to just say, like, yeah, these are, I understand people's, uh, you know, impet I understand the impetus to be self-serious about these kinds of these kinds of things because these are serious issues, but I think that some, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and I think that there's more than one way to build empathy, mm -hmm. and I think the one way to build empathy is to invite people to come in and laugh and enjoy themselves, and so uh, uh, it has been a, the most delightful thing about the reception to the movie for me has been, you know, we've now shown it to predominantly black audiences, we've shown it to predominantly white audiences, we've shown it at the Hamptons Film Festival, we've shown it at Morehouse, the HBCU in Atlanta, we've shown it in England and France, uh, East Coast, West Coast, and uh, every kind of person now at this point has come out of the movie and told me that they found something that resonated with them, yeah. and that has been um, really, really delightful. We, we had a 65-year-old, a, a um, I think she was 65, she said, I think she said, and, and she came up to us. We showed the film in Savannah, Georgia, at, the, at SCAD, at the SCAD Festival, and this woman came up um, and she said, I'd like to talk to you about your film. And I was like, ooh, okay. Uh, and she said, she, said, I, she said, I really, really loved it. And I realized I was laughing so hard. And she said, halfway through the film, I realized that I was laughing at myself. Mm -hmm. And she said, and that felt so good. She said, mm -hmm. there was sort of like so cathartic. And, and, and she said, I feel like I've been so stressed and tense about these kinds of things for decades now. And, and you gave us an opportunity to laugh. And, and think about these things. So that to me is, uh, 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 you know, Norman Lear just died and, uh, you know, the king of satire for many years in America. And I was listening to a, uh, an interview of his after he passed and, and when I was driving around LA and uh, the, the reporter asked him if, if he thought that satire could change the world. And he said, he said I, I, I don't actually believe that satire can change the world. But what I do think is that satire can make a person think. And in thinking, they may be able to change their own minds. And that changes the world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just wanted to make a movie that invited people in to, to laugh and think. And that's it. Can I, can I mention a tweet that I read the other day? Yes. Because, you, know, you know, we look at that stuff. Well, what are they saying about the movie? What's, what's going on? <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're psychotic for doing that. I locked true. myself out of Twitter. I That's can't true. look at it. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I read this. It's, 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 
you know, by his profile pic, looked like a you know young like mid twenties or late twenties uh, a black man, and he wrote that um, wa I watched American fiction and there was this curious white woman sitting in front of me, and after the movie she said obviously he said this in more concisely than I'm saying it now, but the, the essence was, she, he said, after the movie, she said to me, when you laughed, it gave me permission to laugh. I really appreciated that. He said, he said, he said we have a date for uh, past lives next weekend. It was, like, it, it was the greatest thing. That's it was funny. the greatest thing. Yeah. It um, was so good. Um, Jeffrey, on the same sort of line that we were just talking, your character, Monk, um, could have easily uh, be spouting the gospel or being a classist. And, and instead, you make him e e vulnerable, um, flawed, uh, self-deprecating. Can you tell us about, about navigating that line? Well, uh, we, Cord and I had several conversations about not making this a, you know, a classist, uh, seeing this uh, story through a classist lens and making it some type of celebration of the talented 10th black bourgeoisie in any, you know, in any, in any means. But uh, so it was important, I think, that the flaws be there, not only as kind of psychological and emotional flaws, but also to some extent flaws in his argument, perhaps, or at least... Uh, you know, vulnerabilities, that he's not necessarily mm, a perfectly reliable narrator. And I think the scene with Sintara, where the two of them confront, that was one that we were really building up to because it was very clear from the script that that kind of presented a thesis argument for the film. But that, and I think Cord was really, really um, smart in the way that he, uh, he crafted that because it's not in the book, they never meet in the book, but, um, the thesis lies somewhere between the two of them. Uh, somewhere on the table between them is the truth. And I think the truth is as interpreted by the viewer. So that it's on the table, where on the table in between them, it, 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 you know, exactly it is. We can't necessarily say what percentage of her uh, perspective is, you know, is, is, is in the mix relative to his. But, um, it's also important in that moment too, I think, that Monk be stifled, that he be, you know, he be, you know, he gets the hand to the face. So we see that, hmm, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's got some issues. He's got some issues relative to his argument. Uh, and I think it lends him a greater vulnerability, but I think it also lends him the opportunity through self-reflection to evolve. And so that's one of the turning points for him because the monk that we see at the beginning of the film is not the monk we see at the end. And so, um, so um, yeah, I think that was written in the script uh, uh, or at least the scaffolding for that, for my performance was very much there in the script. I was just taking cues from uh, the information that Cord was offering. And you mentioned this trajectory, this arc of, you know, the defrosting of Monk, but it's subtle, it's so, you know, done very delicately. You know, were you calibrating that, that trajectory? I think of the scene with Eric Alexander where she says to you not being able, um, you know, uh, what was the, about the... Not the, being able to relate to people doesn't make you uh, uh, interesting. Is not a badge of honor, right? Makes you an asshole. Well, he actually, you know, he's rattled by. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it, she um, as well kind of stifles him and 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 you know undoes him. And I think what you know, it, I love that scene because he seems so completely oblivious to that mm -hmm. <laughs> until that moment. And 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 it. Um, yeah, it's just a wonderful undoing that, that again, I think because he's not an uncaring person, he's not an unfeeling person. Um, so he, um, you know, he takes these things, these things on board. As well, <clears throat> I think there's something interesting that may be revealed in the scene, the, my pathology scene, where he writes this novel out of spite and outrage and, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and, and bitterness. It's interesting to me, well, when we shot that scene, 
the force with which it was performed was so impressive to me. Keith David and Oak, brilliant actors. And when they rehearsed that scene, it was so intentional and so powerful. I said to myself, and I think I said to Cord, that legitimizes the entire film. I agree. Because again, it calls into question Monk's dismissiveness of that genre, because there's something, yes, it's funny, but there's also something, there's something visceral mm -hmm. within it. And there's also something revealed, I think, about Monk. It's he, at least the scene that we see from that book, the excerpt that he writes, is a confrontation between a father and a son. And in some ways, it's an expression of rage uh, from him toward his own father about the disappointments that he's known seven years prior to uh, the beginning of the film and also that he's learning steadily throughout. So again, um, he is in some ways perhaps uh, wrestling with his own, his own broken interiority. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it, and, and he's evolving, as yeah. you know, and so I think it opens him up to a kind of appreciation, or at least forgiveness, if not from Coraline, damn it, uh, <laughs> at least from the audience, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad you brought up that scene because if I have to pick one scene in the, the films I've seen this past year that knocked my socks off is that sequence. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned to you, Cord, that we're used to seeing films where um, you know, writers are writing and then they're furiously behind the typewriter and then it cuts to dramatically what they're writing. Yeah. You create this sort of magic realism um, and, and where, you know, the characters are coming alive and they're interacting with him, et cetera. And also on the tone of the piece, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry during that scene. You know, can you tell us about the genesis of that, that scene, which I know wasn't in the book. Yeah, yeah, so <clears throat> in Erasure, the entirety of my pathology is published. So uh, Percival's a brilliant writer and he's, he's very experimental and, and does a lot of metatextual stuff. So the entire, so 110 pages of erasure are my pathology. It's like it's like just stops in the middle. It's a slog. Though. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's a slog. <laughs> it's like 11 <laughs> chapters of just the most outrageous prose you've ever read. Like it's crazy, it's really crazy. Um, but so, so, so the gravity of that when you're reading it, it really, it, it has a profound effect on you because you realize exactly what this guy is doing and putting into the world and how bad it is. Um, or sort of how, how bad you think it's going to be. And then, uh, so, so I knew that I, to your point, I didn't want to, I always hate those scenes where the writers are like pounding the keyboard and then they take a sip of coffee and then they get back to pounding the keyboard. Because it's like, the, A, that is not what writing looks like to me. Writing is <laughs> a very, very, very slow and painful process. I'm never typing fast. Uh, it's just kind of like typing and then is staring at a blank page and then erasing something and then, you know, it's just, it, it is painful and slow and, and so I wanted, I wanted to sort of have a writer that, that you know, that, that we showed the sort of like fits and starts of writing and so I wanted to do that and then I also knew that I wanted to do something that was going to cause the audience to lean forward in their chair a little bit the way that reading the entirety of my pathology and erasure causes you to lean forward in your chair a little bit. And so uh, I wanted to, you know, I, I was like, well, what can we do to actually sort of uh, make this more cinematic and sort of like help the audience understand the gravity of this and also just, you know, make something that's entertaining to watch. And so uh, initially the, the idea was to, that we were gonna, you know, Monk would start typing and then we'd hard cut and he would be in the middle of an, his desk and computer would be in the middle of an alleyway where this confrontation was gonna take place. In the book, it takes place in an alley. And so it was gonna be this cut and then all of a sudden we're out of the study and Monk's at his desk in this dark and dirty alley. Um, but we did not have alley money. We didn't have <laughs> the budget is, for yeah, that. Yeah, this is, we did not have alley money. That is, <laughs> that is how small of a budget we had on this we film. It's not like we were asking alley. for a palace. <laughs> we couldn't get a dirty alleyway. And did uh, you, understand all along that the tone is like the ambiguity of it. Where well, to Jeffrey's point, when I wrote that, 
I wrote it with the idea in mind, like this is going to be on its face ridiculous. The, you, there's because you look at a line like "I hates this man, I hates my mom, and I hates myself," and that's to me. I was like, this is absurd. There's no way that anybody could perform this and sort of make it seem serious. It's going to be really campy and overblown and ridiculous, and everybody's going to be laughing the entire time. And then, you know, it's it's it's. It's the be this is the beauty of sort of collaboration, and and th that is what filmmaking. That's the funnest part about filmmaking to me, is that you think that you have you think that you have in mind what this is going to be, and then all of a sudden somebody that you're working with comes in and says, "What about this?" And it's like, "Oh my God, this sort of like is a revelation," and sort of like you brought something to this that I would have never imagined. And when Oak and Keith David, I didn't think we were going to get Keith David for this film, but he, Keith called me. It's terrific. Yeah, he's amazing. And I was like, "You're going to take this part?" And he was like, "Yeah, it sounds great." And so, um, it's like when two dollars a week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he and he and Oak showed up. And we didn't have a lot of time for rehearsals because, again, we had a low budget. And so we very rarely did big rehearsals for scenes. But this was a scene with a lot of moving parts and sort of like camera moves and, and, and you know, blocking. And so this was one that we started rehearsing well before we started shooting it. And it was, you know, there's, there's sometimes magic on movie sets where it's just kind of like everybody stops and just pays attention to what's happening. Like it's instead of like doing their job, it's like, oh my God, I have to pay attention to what's happening right now in front of the camera. And so when they started rehearsing, it was like one of those things, like you could see, I could see people like sprinting to Video Village to like watch the monitors to sort of to, to see what was going on. And it was just immediately, Oak gets into that soliloquy and it was like, all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, is this good? <laughs> is this actually a good book? Am I, like I, I, I fell into that and, and, I, and it, and it immediately, my perspective immediately shifted because I was like, this is actually, actually what it should be. It shouldn't be silly. It shouldn't be campy and over the top. It should be, you're sitting there wondering like, oh, maybe this is good. And, and, and because that sells the idea that this could be a bestseller. That sells the idea that this could be, you know, that, that sort of like people who, who, who know good literature and know good art are sort of like, believe that this is a good book. Like it's, it's, it helps sell that idea, you know? Like if, if you, I say that if you take that, if you took that soliloquy and just sort of, if, if you told me that that was, you know, the clip that they show for like best actor at the Golden Globes and that, and it was like, oh, for Van Gogh and it, like in my pathology, like I would have believed that and because it was so, he was so profoundly good at that. And so um, that to me was one of the most magic moments of the film was, was really finding that scene because of the collaborators that we hired to come to set and sort of like really open our eyes to what it could be. By yeah. the way, when he says they rehearsed that. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when he, when he said that, you know, they rehearsed that or, uh, uh, you know, well before we filmed, that was like two hours before. That was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's what the budget allowed. Yeah. That's well before yeah. on a 26 day shoot, yeah. Um, Jeffrey, the, the richness of this character and the many facets you get to show, I, I love the fact that you have romantic scenes with Eric Alexander, then you have laugh out loud comedic scenes with John Ortiz, and then you have high drama with Leslie Ogham's. Um, you know, can you tell us about navigating all the different, you know, t tones and, and facets of the character? Well, it was just characteristic of a rich script and a rich story. So it's just more colors to play with. Um, there wasn't any kind of difficulty shifting gears. Um, you know, neither was there difficulty from playing, you know, the kind of, at times, you know, solemn qualities of the family, particularly with the mother to the more, uh, you know, satirical, strange stuff. It's just like, wow, you know, we get to use all of these, all of the crayons in the box. It's, um, that's what, what, that's why I signed up. Um, and, but there were, you know, I, there were different references for me for, um, for, you know, different aspects of the film. Um, uh, really though, what Cord talked about in terms of the collaboration and 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 what you know others are bringing to the space at any time. I mean, that's that's what I love about what we do as well. And 
that's what I found here. I found a group of actors that were, one, equally passionate about being there mm -hmm. um, and just wonderful at what they do. So there was so much that we were, you know, that they were giving me. Um, and it just made my job all the easier. For example, with John Ortiz, John and I had never worked together. It, he showed up like two days before. Uh, I guess he cored, uh, just to keep it interesting, cast him about 10 days before we started filming. <laughs> and, uh, but John and I have known each other for over 25 years uh, from New York, the theater scene. In fact, we've shared a green room in the public theater in New York, he, he, him doing one play and, 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 and me doing another. Uh, but we'd never worked, but I knew, or at least I had a strong feeling of how he would work. Um, and I was right. It was just, oh man. It was just like, you know, you just, you just, you know, he hit the ball, I hit it back, you know? And sometimes we hit it together. You know, sometimes we, you know, bounce it off one another's heads just for the, you know, you know the shits and giggles. But it, we just had a weather, wonderful, like, you know, kind of a shared language uh, together. So that was that. And we got it, you know. Again, Cord's clear, first time director, very clear communicator. And that's what directing is, communication and leadership. And he communicated on the screen and he communicated uh, on set, but there was so much being communicated from that script you know, the tones, the irony, and John and I just go, oh, yeah, let's go with this. Uh, Leslie, whom, you know, Miss I've, been, I've adored forever. Oh I mean, God. Leslie Uggams, come on. I mean, from roots to the Rat Pack, I mean, she's just, you know, so the story, you know, on the beach, yeah. here's Leslie. Who's uh, you know she's 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 uh, not as young as she once once was, and we're filming that scene on the beach. It's late With September. The wind blowing. The wind, and you know, it's cold. It's late September. We're in Situate, a town about forty-five minutes south of Boston, and it's you know late September. She's wearing nothing. Wearing no. nothing. It's wet. It's cold, and you know we're running back and forth on the beach all night. And I you know I want, obviously we want to get the scene, but we want to make sure that she's well, that she doesn't get sick, and so I'm saying, Leslie, are you okay? Yeah, fine, okay, let's do it again. I'm, and Cord and the crew are up on a seawall about 30 yards away, and saying, yeah, we're good, we're doing it. And we're going back and forth, of course, getting different angles, and you know, again, Leslie, yeah, okay, well, yeah, we're good, we're not. And then I, I, you know, I'm saying, Cord, run up to Cord, you know, I think we need a couple more, we, you know, we need some more shots, you know, so I go now, Leslie, do you think we can get one more? She says, of course, we're making a movie. <laughs> She thought she said, just remember your lines, <laughs> son. Come on, Rolex. I mean, old pro, you know? <laughs> and so, it, it, you know, it, it really is about, um, it's what's on the page. It's about mutual understanding between, you know, the, the, the scene partners. And then it's about just going for it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, hard to believe, Cord, that you're a first-time director. There is... There is uh, some of the choices you made, like when when his um, sister is dying and the camera just stays on her feet, and then the camera cuts to Jeffrey's reaction. It's such an amazing choice and so powerful. Can you tell us about how you came about shooting that scene that way? Yeah, thanks. The, the you know, uh, sometimes. You, I honestly think that, uh, yes, it, it, you always want more money. You always need more money to, for the film. We would have loved to have more time to shoot. But I really do think that sometimes, uh, you know, making films is just creative problem solving. And when you don't have a lot of money, it forces you to be more creative. And I think that that's, that's one of the good things about having less money to be honest. And so, for instance, the music that we used in the film, uh, we had to find songs that were really good and not expensive. And so that forced us to dig and find some interesting music that, that you might not hear otherwise. And so, you know, there's music in there that I really love that I think is fantastic that has never been used in films before. And I think that, and that, and that happened because it's like we can't go out spending a hundred grand on every song in the film. And so, you know, in the same vein, when we, sh when we went to shoot that, we just had a bunch of background actors. We did not have um, 
we didn't have anybody who actually knew what to do in event of a heart attack. And so I knew that we couldn't put the camera in the room or sort of like have this huge window into what was going on because <laughs> If you actually saw what was going on, it was it was crazy. It was like it was like it was truly just people running around a room, like holding stethoscopes in the sky. And it's like, yeah, this is this is not, I think, what happens in event of a heart attack. This this is sort of like uh, it causes yeah. a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Clown college doctors. Uh, it was just it, it was it was. That's I great. was like, this is this is not going to work. This looks ridiculous if we actually try to try to sort of like shoot in this and, and show show what's going on. And so I was like, let's come up with a creative solution. We don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of time. What's a creative solution that, that will give us a, the shot that we need and, 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 and get the emotion that we need? And I was like, well, well, let's look at it from Monk's point of view, right? And so he's not allowed in that room, but of course he wants to be as close as possible. And it, it, I liked the idea of it being frustrating that he can't see her face, that sort of like he's, he knows that this, this person that he loves deeply is in there and he can't see her face and he can't see what's happening. And so he's just stuck staring at the movement of her feet to try to, to try to see what's happening to his sister. And then, you know, when you see the chest compression stop and the feet are still motionless, you sort of, that's all you need to know. You know, that's the visual storytelling. It's not, you don't need to hear a flat line or anything. I didn't want a flat line like you hear in every single movie when it's like, to signify that this person is dead. It's like, doo and it's like, oh, okay, they're dead. I was like, what, I was like, what can we do that's not that, that's not tropey, that we haven't seen a million times before? And I was like, what if we just do this? And just, you just see a sliver of this and you then you see Monk's reaction from the opposite, the reverse. I love seeing Jeffrey's, Monk's breath on the window there just to see how close he's looking in. And then, you know, I think Jeffrey's performance there when he just kind of stumbles backward, um, sort of, uh, you know, totally uh, zombified and, and sort of like dumbstruck. Uh, and then you said, have that beautiful shot against the sort of like backlit in the, in the hallway. I just think that that was all you needed. You know, you didn't need more than that to tell the story. And I think that uh, I'm just really, really happy with how that turned out. And that it turned out that way because we didn't have a lot of money. And I really liked it. Well, kudos to you. Um, another scene that blew my mind is that where where he walks in and the book is being read and and then a white woman stands up and blocks. And, and I, I always tell my students that look for the metaphor seen in a movie and to me that's like a huge you know moment a huge yeah. metaphor absolutely you know, tell us about uh, that i actually stole that from a gif that i saw online once and it was uh it's a real sh it's a it's taken it's directing from a by gifs <laughs> <laughs> yeah i look i'm a child of the internet so so that, that, that is there's a lot of the internet in my brain unfortunately uh, but finally, it had some some practical use, and it was there's this GIF that I saw years ago where it's uh, from a bat. It's a live telecast of a basketball game, and there's this black basketball play player, uh, David Robinson, and he's sitting there, and the camera's focusing on David Robinson as the commenters are talking about who that is, and then r right uh, as they're talking about him, this this woman stands up and just puts her face right in front of his, and I remember thinking it was such a funny image. And when I was thinking about what's a visual metaphor for sort of like uh, Monk being, um, Monk sort of like, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of like the, the praise and the sort of the, the, the um, supporters of, of, of uh, Centauro sort of like washing out Monk and, 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 and covering him up and his, his, I guess his unenthusiastic nature up. Uh, I just remembered that gif from, um, from like 10 years ago. It's really, I mean, yeah. You never know where inspiration is gonna lie. <laughs> but it always felt like a powerful metaphor to me, you know? Again, like, th this is, I think that um, I, I was, you know, well, I'm, I'm good. I'm done. I don't you need never to told talk me more. That I don't story. need to talk you never more. Told yeah, me that. yeah. I mean, I wish I. I actually wish we could. I just realized that we're up here, huge. By the yes. way, a couple minutes ago. Oh, we are. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Freaked me out a little bit. I hope it's not freaking you guys out in the audience. But, but, just Google David Robinson White Lady GIF, and you can see what I'm talking we're, about. We're, we're almost doing it ourselves yeah. here. We're almost <laughs> recreating yeah. that. Yeah. And last question, gang, because I'm getting the hook over here. Um, 
what, what, what do you guys want ultimately the audience to take away from, from, from your film? Well, um, I'll, I'll let Cord have the last word uh, this time. Um, but, <laughs> um, I think for me, what's been gratifying is, in fact, just today, uh, when, you know, we've been talking about our film and about ourselves uh, ad nauseum lately, which is a good thing. It's better than the alternative when no one wants to hear about your film. <laughs> Been there too. Um, but uh, it was at an event uh, today and someone came up and one of uh, the latest to say, you know, I just put my mother in home care yesterday. Mm. And the film um, touched me. You know, the, one of the great things about what we do as actors is we have an opportunity to kind of wrestle with even our most difficult circumstances and try to at least make meaning out of them for ourselves, at least give them shape and maybe perhaps control them at least for a moment. And in, in the ideal, we can share that with someone else who at least for the you know two hours that they're watching the film or in, in a moment feel connected and feel validated. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of a gift. Um, so for me, what I think I'd like for the audience is just to find themselves inside this film. Just find a place, um, whether it be in uh, Monk's narrative or in the family or somewhere in there, just find uh, you know, a bit of uh, a room inside the, the, the house that maybe brings a little relief, comfort, laughter. That's it. Simple stuff. Court, you get the last word. Okay. Uh. <clears throat> so the the uh, I feel like the the key to a good adaptation in my mind isn't hewing so closely to the text, right? I think that what it what it is. I, I changed some big things in from the book to this to this film. For instance, in the book. This is a spoiler, but the book's been out for 22 years, so it's your own fault at this point. <laughs> but uh, in the book, his sister is murdered by an anti-abortion activist who comes into her Planned Parenthood clinic and kills her and several of the other employees. And so clearly to have that be the way that Lisa dies in the film, the film takes on a much different tone. You can't really sort of like just have that and then move on from it. It sort of like needs to be a thing that carries through. It just becomes a, a very different thing. And so, um, you know, I didn't hew so closely to the text. I changed a lot of stuff. I added some stuff, as Jeffrey said, uh, in order to, to make it, uh, you know, make it my own. And, and uh, but I think that what you do need to hew can closely to. Can you to, tell before, before you get to, the, to, to your uh, summation that can you tell how you this is the last word, yeah, um, no, 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 so see, I get the I'm, last I'm word. Got, I'm saying, I'm, I, come on, I'm hedging a little bit, but, but, but you just reminded me, the first version in the script, uh, in the first version of the script that I read, when she, she dies in the ambulance, what yeah. it was Yeah, oh that? Yeah. yeah, I forgot about that. And it that. was just the most ridiculous thing. She, he's in the ambulance with her, she dies. And he jumps out of the ambulance. The moving ambulance yeah. rolls on yeah. to the floor, yeah. into the curb. I mean, this is that is that that is that is the the mark of a first time director <laughs> having no idea that we'd have to have stunt people and it would just way more money than we had. It would be a disaster. You'd have to have to go into con concussion <laughs> protocol for a week. But that it was. I loved it. I, I loved thought it was cool. I, th I did. Yeah, it. I, did I like well. that. Anyway, I thought that was cool. I'm sorry, Corey. No, no, I'm please. Sorry. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I'm happy. Well, that that's the next movie. Um, but but uh, now I lost my train of thought. Yeah. What was I saying? Can somebody remind me what I'm saying? We you were talking about oh why yes the yes 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 so 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 instead of hewing closely to the text I think what you need to hew closely to is the spirit of the thing and the and the feeling of the thing and and the essence of what you think that the author was trying to do and I think that that's the key to to making an adaptation that doesn't feel bloodless and so one of the you know the the three sort of like pillars that I felt were necessary that I took from the book to maintain the spirit of what Percival was trying to do was one it needed to be funny because the book is very funny. The second was that you know there's a lot of metatextual stuff in the book, so I wanted to make sure to maintain some of that meta, meta stuff in in the film. And then the last was that was that the, um, the there's an epilogue of the book erasure, and the epilogue is this is this Latin phrase that I was unfamiliar with, and and it, it's generally used in relation with complex mathematics, I guess, which 
Uh, Percival Everett studied mathematical logic when he was in his undergrad years. He's, he's a brilliant man. Who did? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and the, the rough translation of the Latin is, I offer no hypothesis. And so to me, that suggested that we couldn't make a film that was didactic, that felt like it was spoon feeding people moral lessons, that sort of it was, this is not an op-ed column, you know, this is a film. And this is, so so when people ask me what I want people to take away from the film, I usually just say a smile. Uh, that, is, that is honestly what I want people to take away from it. I think that this is a movie that I made for people to sort of think about themselves. And I want you to come in and I want you to have a good time and be entertained. And then, like like Norman Norman Lear said, you know, maybe go away and think a little bit, and, and sort of like come to a conclusion yourself. I think that um, the, the the thing that the thing that's interesting about race uh, uh, is that it is both real and not real, right? So so the vast majority of scientists will tell you that. Race has no basis in, in biology, that sort of like all of these things that we consider racial differences are not real, and that in fact we're all far more similar than we are different, uh, regardless of the color of our skin. And so, so that is real, and yet what is also real is that we've structured our society and our institutions based on the idea that race is real. And so we exist in this world in which this thing, this very important thing, is both insignificant and not real, and significant and very real, right? And so there's this inherent tension in that absurdity to me. And uh, that to me is sort of ripe for comedy and ripe for sort of like making fun of it. And I think that, but, but I think that what's also necessary to understand is that means that there is no right answer to this stuff. There's no right or wrong answers to these things. This is all sort of complicated and nuanced and difficult and it feels like it feels like we're all trying to, you know, we've all been working so hard to try to make this thing that's not real, real. And it feels like pin the tail on the donkey, like in the dark, or we're just walking around kind of poking each other, trying to sort of like make this thing make sense. And so this is a movie that I think struggles with that, grapples with that idea, you know? And I think that as, as Jeffrey was saying, that, that that scene with Centaur and Monk, is the, the theme of the movie and sort of the thesis of the movie exists somewhere in between those two people. And sort of it's up to you to decide how you, how you feel about these things because there isn't a right answer. Because it's all fake, but it's all real. I'm sorry about that. That's a weird thing. To, that's a weird way to end it. But that, that is <laughs> well, my feeling. So I hope you take away a smile. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cord. You've done, it's an amazing film. And... I'm so grateful to you to have given one of our greatest actors a role worthy of his talents. Absolutely, and, thank you very and, much. Um, and, and thank you to the two of you for being here tonight. Great honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you for staying. Thank you for being here.